Right, well, thank you very much, and, and good morning. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here in High Wycombe today, uh, where my role is really to introduce the notion of flood risk and try and put it in the context of insurance. And I guess I'm really on the undercard for, for Gay, who's then going to speak about uh, the latest CEM report on best practice in flood risk due diligence. And I think there should be some time for questions after that. So where to start? Well, environmental risks have existed in the UK for a very long time. In fact, as long as humans have inhabited this small section of the Earth's surface, they've had to face up to extreme weather and floods, periods of drought, and many other risks. And despite the advances of our civilization over thousands, even millions of years, many of these risks remain today. Risks to people and homes and businesses. And although forecasting is a notoriously difficult game, a dangerous game, if you were to ask me to have a punt on what the most significant of these risks is now and in the future, I would say flooding. One of the reasons it's so significant is that flooding can have a wide variety of causes. I guess the types of flooding that um, spring to mind most readily would probably be flooding from rivers and flooding from the sea, which are both extremely significant, of course. But, if you'll excuse the pun, less than half the properties at flood risk in the UK are through these channels. Surface water flooding is extremely significant as well. Now, this is flooding which is caused by the drainage capacity of a particular system being exceeded. It could be both natural drainage, you know, the infiltration capacity of the ground, and also man-made drainage systems. A large proportion of the devastating floods across the UK in 2007 was actually this type of flooding. And surface water flooding is particularly problematic because, unlike river and coastal flooding, it doesn't confine itself to the traditional boundaries of the river or the coastal floodplain. In essence, it can happen anywhere at any time, and most of us can be at flood risk. Then we have things like groundwater flooding, where the water table simply rises to the ground surface, and flooding from kind of man-made causes as well, reservoir failures, sewer floods, etc., etc. Now, I know that some of you here are probably likely to have been affected by the 2007 floods and other floods and appreciate this risk more than others. I lived in Oxfordshire at the time, which is less than an hour's drive from here, and while my house was safe, that was my road, it looked more like a river. But whether you've been personally affected by flooding or not, it's important to recognise the vital role of insurance in managing the potentially severe financial risks of flooding. But first of all, let's try and put some numbers to this concept of flood risk. So, according to the Environment Agency, around 5.2 million properties in England and Wales are now at risk of flooding. Only 2.4 million of those are due to rivers in the sea, and around 2.8 million are at risk of surface water flooding alone. So you can see the, the fact that it's not just rivers in the sea that are causing problems. And it's not a constant either. Flood risk is rising over time. Scientific predictions say that as a result of climate change, there's an increased probability that we'll see an increase in frequency and the magnitude of extreme weather events like floods in the future. And it's not just climate change either. Things like urbanisation, development on floodplains, um, risk or sort of land management practices changing are some of the many contributing factors as well. And indeed, insurers can already point to evidence for this rising flood risk. In the 1990s, ABI, the Association of British Insurer Members, paid out around £1.5 billion on flood claims over that 10-year period. Whereas in the noughties, the last 10 years, the figure was three times higher at around £4.5 billion paid out on claims. Now to caveat that figure, I should say that the the catastrophic events in 2007 did near enough make up that difference on their own. And that summer was really, a really, really terrible event, of course, and uh, it cost insurance companies an awful lot of money. That summer, they dealt with over 180,000 claims, totaling about £3 billion. They also did things like arranging temporary accommodation for thousands of people. And the average claim for a household was over £30,000. And for commercial property, it was considerably higher, over £50,000. I've not had much luck with where I've 
where I've lived in the last few years. And in, uh, in 2009, I, I was actually living in Cumbria. Um, and it was shocking to see the physical damage that happened there when the floods occurred in towns like Cockermouth. But what startled me more about an event like that was to see the impact that the flooding had on people who weren't even physically damaged and it simply was because access to towns and communities was so limited or because people couldn't get to their workplaces, couldn't get between various locations that they needed to go as part of their day-to-day -day business. And it was even more surprising than that to appreciate the timescales involved in getting places like Cockermouth back to some kind of sense of normality. So having seen all of this in such stark terms, I know that these risks are real, and they're risks that need to be protected against. And this is where insurance steps in, specifically buildings and contents, or property insurance. So property insurance is vital to protecting homes and businesses against the damage caused by flooding. And insurers do all they can to protect people and I know this is kind of contrary to the popular myth that insurers are, um, have kind of like blackened cold hearts and they're working with the, ex the express intent to, to try and deny people claims that are valid. And that really isn't the case. And insurers do do all they can to help customers, be that businesses or individuals, who've been the victims of flooding. So what does insurance do specifically against flood risk? Well, here's the current setup. Since the year 2000, Insurers have committed to continue to insure properties at significant risk of flooding through an agreement known as the Statement of Principles, and that is in return for the government continuing to manage flood risk effectively. We also, that's the Statement of Principles there. We also have a situation in the UK where flood cover is offered as a standard component of buildings and contents insurance in the UK, and this is an almost unique situation in Europe. And these two points together have had a lot of positive benefits, giving customers in flood risk areas the confidence that they'll be able to get their insurance policies renewed. I should also say that the statement of principles applies to residential and small business properties, but it doesn't apply to larger commercial organisations, who will tend to have more bespoke insurance arrangements in place. Uh, and I'm leaving Gay to talk about the more commercial side of things after my talk. The arrangements been coming under increasing pressure in recent years. Increasing flood risk is one reason for this, but the arrangement also has some pretty severe shortcomings anyway. So the arrangement distorts the insurance market. New entrants to the industry don't have any business in high-risk areas, and they can avoid offering insurance in areas that they now know to be at high risk of flooding. And furthermore, the assurance that cover will continue to be provided also serves to reduce the incentives on property owners, local communities, the government, to invest in flood risk management and take their own responsibility for flood risk. On the other hand, insurers are bound to continue to offer cover in high-risk areas, often at uneconomic rates. And in a highly competitive market, this leaves insurers at a considerable commercial disadvantage. So it's bad for the insurance market, but it's bad for consumers as well. They lose out because as new insurance companies enter the market, they avoid particular areas, meaning that consumer choice is limited. And in many cases, the existing players can only offer cover on terms that are unattractive for customers, for example, with high excesses or premiums. And cover that's unattractive from the customer's perspective is likely to be unprofitable from the insurer's perspective too. So we have an unsustainable position for both parties. So to summarise thinking on the Statement of Principles, I should be very clear that insurers are going to continue to honour their commitments under this agreement until it expires in 2013, but it will not be renewed beyond that point. What we need going forward is a lasting, long-term and sustainable solution which encourages government, individuals, insurers, businesses to share responsibility for flood risk better. And we're working really closely with the government now and other stakeholders to ensure that that happens. I think three areas will be particularly vital in making sure we reach a good outcome in this process and making sure that flood insurance remains viable going into the future. First of all, the government needs to overcome funding pressures to continue to dis deliver effective flood risk management outcomes on the ground. It's really important. It's vital. Second, we need publicly available flood risk data, which is accurate and up-to-date, to continue to